Would you bow your head for a moment? We bless and honor that name above all names today. The name of Jesus the Christ. We get a head start. We, we bend our knees now and our tongues confess that in fact you are the Lord. Men, the only Lord in your name is above every name. Thank you for this time to worship you and thank you for our assembly and thank you for your presence in our midst. We pray now for circumcised ears and ready hearts that are seedbed for your word. Pray as your word is sown that we'll catch it, that we'll receive it, that we'll bring forth 30 and 60 and a hundredfold to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you tell the person next to you, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. And would you say with a flair, I'm particularly glad to be seated here next to you. Amen. Commission part two, commissioned part two. We've also been commissioned. We've also been commissioned. Let's look at our text this morning found in Matthew chapter 28. Verses 16 through 20 from the New Revised Standard Version. Will you stand with me as we read the gospel together? Now the 11 disciples, who's reading with me, went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Amen. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Glory to God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Glory to God. So two weeks ago, we talked about what it means to be commissioned. And in July, we began a series uh, entitled Called, and then what else? Consecrated. Somebody had it. And thank you, Sister Gunn. And then now, commissioned. All right. Called consecrated and commissioned that as the Lord summons us to his service, he invites us into a period, a place, a time, a lifelong commitment of consecration where we separate ourselves from the things that get in our way from serving him fully and completely. But we looked at uh, the 12th chapter of Romans together where we said we are called to present our bodies to him as living sacrifices and to allow our minds to be what? Renewed and transformed, that our lives are transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we go from being called to being consecrated, amen. And then after we've engaged in a period and a process of consecration, a, a commissioning comes a charge, an assignment, um, um, an intentional job that the Lord wants us to engage. So we said to be commissioned meant, um, meant uh, that someone uh, would give us authority. So to be commissioned means to give authority to. It means to accredit, to license, to empower, to enable, uh, to entitle, to qualify somebody to do something. So when you're commissioned to do something, someone gives you authority to do it. All right. All right. All right. Hmm? By what authority do you say these words? I've been given authority by the Lord to speak. I've been given authority by the church to speak, uh, to, to accredit somebody to do something, to license them. Are you with me? Yeah. To empower them, to enable them, to entitle them, to qualify them to do something. It's, it's, it, it's the reason that we have church structure and infrastructure. Yeah. Hmm? That, that we can't just jump out and say, I liked it so I thought I'd just do it and I think I'll lead it now that I'm here. 
wait a minute, sister. Wait a minute, brother. Sit down for a minute. Let us get to know you. Let us get to see how God is working in and through you. Let us get to see your surrendered life in the presence of the Lord. We're not going to lay hands on anybody. Suddenly we got to see what you're made of before we accredit you, before we empower you, before we commission you to lead. Commission means that we've been um, commanded to do something, ordered to do something, instructed to do something. We've been directed to do something. It takes a commissioner right. to be able to give a commission. Yeah. Take somebody with authority to be able to delegate authority to others. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? So when we grew up in the house, amen, sometimes it, it, our big sister would say, clean up your room. And you say, you ain't my mama. <laughs> right? You don't have the what? Authority. Now your brother tell you, take out the garbage. You say what? You ain't my what? Daddy. You can't tell me to take out the garbage. Now, if auntie comes to the house, or babysitter, or grandma comes to the house, you gonna take that garbage out with the quickness because that person has been commissioned. That person has the authority. That person has the right uh, to require something of you. Throughout the scripture, we see men and women being commissioned to carry out the plan and the purpose of God. Beginning in Genesis, we see God commissioning Adam to take care of the animals and to tend the Garden of Eden. Remember that? Yeah. Then God also commissioned Noah, huh, who was already an old man, to build an ark and then round up animals, one male, one female, to bring them into the ark and then to seal the door. Uh, we uh, watched as God commissioned Moses to leave the mountainside uh, where he was tending sheep and to go back to Egypt to demand that God's people be set free, to oversee the liberation process, to lead the way through the Red Sea, and to comfort and shepherd them through 40 long years of wilderness wandering. And then we watched as Moses commissioned Joshua. Moses said, now I'm the tender of sheep, but you the fighter. Come on, you are the conquest leader. I commission you now to take them from this edge of the promise deeply into the promise. I'm too old and too tired to fight. You got it from here, Josh, right? And so he commissions Joshua, and he leads them uh, in conquest in order to possess the promised land. These are examples of people in Scripture being commissioned, all right? All right. All right? All through scriptures, we see men and women commissioned by the Lord or by somebody who has more maturity or, or, or more, is more seasoned in ministry than they are in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The apostle Paul admonishes his son, Timothy, his son in ministry. He says, I solemnly urge you, it was on the text that you all showed today, to preach the word, to be persistent whether things are favorable or unfavorable. To rebuke, nobody likes that. To convince, to encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Uh -huh. Earlier, Paul had laid his hands on young Timothy and ordained him to ministry. Timothy was a young man, and his task was laborious, and it was difficult. But God gave him the grace and the power to answer the call and to respond to the commission. It's exciting to read about other people's commissions. We love the story of Esther. Come on, the young uh, uh, orphaned uh, Jewish um, uh, girl who becomes the queen of Persia. Yeah. There's not a more sparkling story. She saved her people from genocide. Oh, we cheer for her because we know the secret of her identity. And, and we root for her as she goes before the king unsummoned. We say, go little orphan girl, the Lord be with you from the safety, come on here, of our bed with covers pulled up around our neck, huh? We love that Ezra was sent to, to be the scribe and Nehemiah the governor of Judah when the exiled Jews returned from Babylon to their homeland. We say, go Nehemiah, leave the king's court and return to leave your people, rebuild the wall, legislate justice, reestablish order, do your thing, boy. 
But the text for this morning reminds us that it's not only the Samuels who are called or the Esthers who have been commissioned. God has not only commissioned Timothy or Joshua, God has in fact commissioned you. Would you put your hand on your head and say, God, the God of the universe has commissioned me. In our text for this morning, we see a group of disciples collectively receiving a commission. It's a, a commission given to them, and it's a commission given to us. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew occurs first in the canon. It's the first gospel we come to when we open our Bible, but it was written second. And if you had a chance to read your text closely or even to watch the chosen, come on here, get a little cheat sheet, you'll see that Matthew had a particular story. He was a Jew of Jews, but he was hated by his friends and neighbors and colleagues and community because he was seen as a sellout. Matthew was a tax collector. He derived money from common, everyday, hardworking, poor Jewish people, and he turned the tax money into their Roman oppressors. He was a Jew and even a person who regarded the law of God in his heart, but his work put him in very poor standing with his community. The fact is that they despised him. Matthew still had an ear to hear what the Spirit of God would say to him. While he looked tough at the exterior, God always looks at the heart. And while we look at the outward appearance, God is looking at the inside. And while we disqualify based on the outside, God is qualifying based on the inside. And while we shun based on how you look, God is welcoming based on what he sees in your heart. And while we uh, 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 think less of, God elevates because of the condition of the heart, Matthew was seated at the tax collector's booth, doing his thing, having heard Jesus preach and teach, having seen Jesus move about across the, the uh, Galilean countryside. And when he saw Jesus, Jesus looked him in the eye. He said, follow me. Let me tell you this. Matthew didn't collect the tax money. Matthew didn't fold up the napkin at the booth. Matthew didn't take off his coat or put it on. He jumped up from the table, leapt up, and followed Jesus as a disciple. What the disciple couldn't see, what they couldn't perceive about their new and unwelcome colleague was that he had a meticulous mind for remembering details and facts, for chronicling history. And Jesus said, he will write the first book that appears in the canon about my story. God said, I choose him because I know what I put in him and I know what I can get out of him. I know what he's been commissioned to do. Matthew is a Jew, unapologetically an Israelite, and he writes to Jews, and he has a deep passion to compel Jewish people to believe the unbelievable. That is the Messiah that they've been waiting for for centuries. Sister Betty Jordan was, in fact, that little boy with some curious birth circumstances. Come on, somebody said mama was pregnant before they got married, that, in fact, the Messiah is married. Mary's baby that in fact the Messiah was the carpenter for 33 years. Matthew begins his book with a genealogy that traced Jesus' history, his family line from Abraham to Joseph. He wants to be sure that Jewish people can get the picture uh, that Jesus has the authority of God, that he is the son of God, that he's the son of Abraham, that he's the son of David, that in fact he's the Messiah. Oh, Matthew is relentless. He's not fooling around. He understands his assignment. Uh, and, so, and so Matthew follows, and he writes, and he gives us Jesus' lineage and Jesus' parentage, and he lays out the process by which the sacrificial son of Abraham, that's Jesus, completed his work. He demonstrates in his gospel how the sovereign son of David was finally restored to his full man majesty and then how the son of David sends his disciples with authority granted to him by the father. In, in the final sec uh, section 
of the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew captures this moment of commissioning. He captures this minute that was for the Jews in the first century and Christians in the first century, and it is for us in the 21st century. Matthew 28 is the final note in the gospel writer and tax collector's treatise on the life of Jesus Christ while he was on earth. It's situated sometime after the resurrection. There's a parallel found in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. So sometime, friends, during this 40-day period after Jesus resurrected, but while he was still on earth, the 11 disciples minus who? Judas. Good for you, Judas, plus many more of Jesus' followers went to Galilee to the side of a mountain where Jesus told them to meet him. The text begins with Jesus appearing in Galilee when he told the disciples he would meet them later on a mountainside. We don't know the name of the mountain range, but the disciples who heard him knew where to meet him, and they assembled themselves there. As a quick side note, the other gospel writers, several of them, write about Jesus' ascension. They write about what happened after he went up, how he was caught up into the clouds, how he ascended up into the air. But Matthew is not as interested in the ascension as he is in the commission. And he doesn't want to end his gospel talking about how Jesus went up. He wants it to leave it right in your lap. He wants you to remember that you have been given a charge. That you have a responsibility. If you're an introvert, you're responsible. If you're an extrovert, you're responsible. If you're outspoken, you have a charge. If you're quiet, you have a charge. If you like to tell people, you have a responsibility. If you don't like to tell anybody, you still have a commission. If you're old, God is counting on you. If you're young, God is counting on you. You have been commissioned. Matthew said, I'm not going to talk about Jesus floating into the air because I don't want you to think about heaven until you handle your business on earth. I worry a little bit about the church, do you? Because we have such a secure culture. We know the songs and the clap and the dress and the actions and the attitude. And it's possible for us to be so content with us four and no more. Sometimes we don't like when unsaved people come in. They don't dress like us. They don't act like us. They don't smell like us. Huh? We don't want them to sit next to us. We're a little annoyed and uncomfortable by their presence. They don't present themselves as polished or sanctified. It's because they're not. And rather than our loving them into the kingdom of God, we're annoyed and made uncomfortable by them. I'm a little worried about the church. Because I'm not sure that we haven't fallen in love with our trappings and forgotten almost completely our charge. We can go a whole year and not tell one person that Jesus Christ died so that they might live eternally. We can go a year and not witness to one single solitary individual. We'll be on an elevator with folk every day and we say nothing about the fact that the king eternal, immortal, in the, invisible is, 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 is in love with them. We sit on the train and on the bus. We sit in restaurants. Our grandchildren come to our house and they're heathens. Our nieces and nephews sit at our table and they're going to hell. And it seems like it's not that big of a deal for us because we open not our mouths. Our best friends growing up are not saved. And we haven't said a thing. Maybe it's not enough to say you went to church today. 
Maybe the gospel is bigger than I went to church today. Our next door neighbors need to know the word of God and to know the love of God. And I don't know how compelled we feel to tell them. We love the church as it is. But we can't see the people sinking down. We're not compelled to reach out a hand and lift them up. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guess why? Because it is the only power of God for salvation. You can't be saved without the gospel. But now if you don't tell people the gospel, how can they be saved? And if they're not saved does that relegate them to the other category which is lost and do we care do we care for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ we don't like Christ as judge but he has a judgment seat for the deeds done in our bodies friends the difference on the on the day that we stand before the judgment seat of Christ is whether or not we said, I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. Huh? I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and rose so that I might have eternal life. If we don't tell them, how will they know? Andre Krause said, tell them. Even if they don't believe you, tell them. Even if they don't receive you, tell them for me. Tell them for me that I love them. And I came to let them know. Jesus appears on the mountainside. And the 11 disciples and the other followers saw him. Now let's admit, he already looked a little different. How do we know? Because the guys on the Emmaus Road who were walking didn't recognize him when he appeared. How do we know? Because Mary thought he was a gardener when she saw him. Now, the body after the, the post-resurrection body looked a little different yeah. from, from the earthly body that he had had. And so maybe some doubted because he didn't look like himself, but I rather believe that some people actually just couldn't bring themselves to the place where they could fully embrace the supernatural is unfolding before me. This thing is really real. So, so as Jesus appears before he says a word, some people who are convinced of his lordship bow and worship him. And the scripture said, and, and I appreciate the truth of Matthew, he said, but some doubted. Maybe they doubted, not that he had resurrected, but is this really him? Maybe they doubted, could this really be happening? I'm 56, and in 56 years, I never saw a person get up from the dead and then show up on a mountain. Some people who were following him still doubted. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Some people who call themselves disciples still doubted. One of Jesus' closest friends doubted so badly that doubt became uh, uh, the preamble to his name. He's called what? Doubting Thomas. <laughs> doubt. Why don't you say with me, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me not to see you acting right in front of me. And I still had a spirit of doubt occupy my heart and mind. Help my unbelief. Help me to know that what you said to me will surely come to pass. Help my unbelief. Help me to know that you're not a man that you should lie. That every word that you speak, oh, amen, is, is, is solid, is rooted. That you watch diligently over your word to perform it. Help my unbelief. Some doubted and, and Jesus spoke anyway. I'm going to speak to the believers. I'm going to speak to the doubters. I'm going to tell you that you've been given a charge. Jesus' charge has um, one central theme. The theme of his charge is the commission that they make disciples. Hmm? Their responsibility was to make disciples. So for the first the first thing that Jesus says, hopefully set the doubters at ease. The first thing he says is, all authority.
authority in heaven and down here where y'all are on earth has been given unto me. You're looking at me now without limitations. Hallelujah. You're looking at me without reservation. All authority has been given to me. I'm in charge. I'm in charge now. I'm in charge. Look, look, look. I'm in charge. The Romans, you watch them handcuff me. You watch them beat me. You watch them strip me of my clothes. You watch them snatch my beard. Out of my, no more of that. I'm in charge. You watch them press a crown of thorns in my head. You watch them beat me with 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. But that's done. I'm in charge. All authority. The Roman government has no authority over me now. Uh, the Sanhedrin has no authority over me now. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, and I'm giving some to you. Now, some of us wouldn't do that. We'd say, finally, my ship came in. <laughs> Baby, I've been waiting for this day. I'm going to let these Negroes know who is the HNIC now. <laughs> That's not Jesus. He says, all authority has been given unto me. Yes. And then he says, and I'm calling you, I'm commissioning you. What is he saying to the people who assembled? I'm commissioning you, and I'm giving you a responsibility uh, to, uh, to make disciples. Uh -huh. Let me say one more word to you about doubt because some assembled but they still doubted. One time Sister Grace Ann was talking to me about a prophet who ministered. That's just a little side note. I'm going to throw it in for free. And she was saying that the prophet who ministered asked people who didn't believe to sit in the back. Right Gracie, did you tell me that? Because the man of God was saying, I'm getting ready to flow in the spirit. But your doubt sets up a block for the power of God to move powerfully. Ain't no shame in it. If you don't believe, sit back there. Because what I need in the front is people who believe God. Don't you remember when Jesus went back to his hometown? Didn't you tell me that, Mama? Jesus went to his hometown. Uh -huh. yes, yes. Do you remember Jesus, the son of the living God, went home? He showed up in the worship service. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and he was fifth. He said, the Holy Spirit has been given to me without measure. He went to the service of worship, and the scripture said he could do nothing but heal a few folk. Jesus, who is God in the flesh, couldn't heal because the people doubted, because they wouldn't believe, because they said, wait a minute. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Wait a minute. I was in fourth grade with him. Wait a minute. Who's he supposed to be now? He's healing people and folk came sick and left sick, not because the power of God was not present to heal, but because they simply would not believe. I want to give you a hint. Um, doubt is sometimes demonically inspired. Remember one time, Sister Syl, we talked about having a mouse in your house. Huh? I'm not saying that you're demon possessed, but I'm saying that sometimes doubt can reside in you because you opened up a door. And if you keep on struggling to believe the word of God, the will of God, and the promises of God, you may need a little deliverance from the spirit of doubt. I'm speaking to people who are constantly plagued by doubt. But in the church, 28 years, you're not sure Jesus is real. Huh? Been saved 12 years, you're not sure that the Holy Spirit really moves in the church. It's the spirit of doubt. That word uh, doubt uh, meant double. It, it means you were double-minded. I think this and I think that. Huh? I, I think this, but I'm not sure. It meant to, to, to be a, a, a wavering. And so Jesus says, all exousia, all authority is given unto me. And then he speaks to them. He tells them that he requires them to make disciples. Now, before then... Jesus had been the disciple maker. Isn't that right? He went about, he called Peter on the boat. He called Andrew. 
he called James and John. He saw Nathaniel under the sycamore tree, right? And he said, look at that Jew. He doesn't have any guile. He called this one. He called that. Remember that? He was summoning people. Matthew, seated at the tax collector table, he called him. He drew disciples. But he said, now it's on you. Now, when I had my earthly ministry, I brought disciples to myself. But the responsibility now is yours. Are you with me? Yeah. I'm calling you to make disciples. Jesus requires that his followers make more followers. Uh -huh. Jesus requires that those who learn from him teach others what they learned. The heart of the Christian ministry is clearly laid out here. It's for us to reproduce in others what God has produced in us. His Jewish followers may have imagined that they would be called a witness just among their Jewish kindred, but the Lord told them that their mission field was much broader. They were to make disciples among all nations. That nations is the word ethnos. It refers to people groups. So they were to go to all nations, all people groups, to share the good news of the gospel and to make disciples of all kinds of people. And so in response, we see Philip. God picked him up from a revival and took him to an African, to an Ethiopian official, to a eunuch of Queen Candace. He ministered God's word to him, baptized him, and then got translated and brought somewhere else in the spirit. That's why we see Paul ministering to Gentiles in Asia and in Europe. He said, go to all nations. The first thing the Lord tells them to do is go. The first charge is to go. Early in his ministry, Jesus invited them to come unto him. But now that they had been with him, right, Jilly? They learned of him. They had taken his yoke upon themselves. They were his followers. Now he tells them to go. I think we're very comfortable with the come unto me. We want to lay our head on Jesus' breast. But at some point, beloved, we should be equipped to what? Go. Not go from our discipleship of Christ. Not go from being a member of a worshiping community. But to go out and be one who seeks the lost ourselves. I want to tell you with shame, I was in Crown Chicken. I'm not ashamed about that part. Even if I was, y'all already know, you probably see a little grease around my mouth even. <laughs> now I was in crap. And the man gave me back too much money. Maybe like $5. So I, I had my little wings. Amen, so excited. I hardly can, but when I counted it, I said, oh, I think you gave me too much. And he said, oh, oh, oh. And so I gave him back the money, and there was a man standing near me. It was perfect. It was a very big dude. He said, oh my God, an honest woman. That was my chance. That was my open door, Sister Smiley Jones. Let me tell you what I felt inside. I should say something to him right now about my Savior who transformed my nasty character who transformed my trifling ways. I should say something to him right now about how I was born in sin, shaping in iniquity, but he brought me out of the miry clay. I should say to the man in the chicken store, hey, one short block from here, you could get some food for your soul. Angie, it was on the tip of my tongue. The man said, hey, I'm going to pay for her food. Um, give her all her money back because I don't see honest people. It was my chance, Ange. I said, thank you, sir, die, and I walked out. I got back in the car with my goddaughter, Minister Villanueva. She said, Godmother, who were you talking to in there? I said, that man paid for my food because of the money. She said, did you invite him to church? Cuban preacher was leaning over the, 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 the wall back here, speaking Spanish to our next door neighbors, who I've said nothing more than good morning to. I'm confessing. I'm confessing. She said, this is a great church. You need to come. You should come. They said, do you go there? She said, that's my church. You should come. She told them in Spanish. What am I going to do when I stand before the Lord? And he said, your whole block went to hell. tells me the big boy from Crown didn't make it.
He tells them to go. <laughs> go means that we traverse geographical boundaries, but it also means that we get going. It, it, to go means to be active. Mm -hmm. To go means to be engaged. Mm -hmm. To go is to be about that. My boyfriend is always trying to get going. Y'all know my boyfriend. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a funny story. So once my boyfriend woke up at two in the morning, he said, oh my God, I gotta get going. I said, where are you going, babe? I, I gotta get going. I gotta get food in his pajamas. <laughs> I gotta get going. I said, where are you going, Dad? I, I gotta get going. I gotta go to work. I said, it's 2.30. You don't have to get going yet. You remember that story? <laughs> this dude is always ready. He has an orientation that says, I'm not gonna sit back. I'm not gonna lay back. I'm not gonna be lax. I'm not gonna lag. He's always like, he's pushing, go. Hey, let's do it. That's what God is calling for us to be is to be ready to go, is to be ready to act, is to be ready to speak even in crowd. Come on, is to be ready to speak in the elevator, is to say my grandchildren are at my house, they're going to hear the word of the Lord, is to say that my son and my daughter are not saved, but I'm going to tell them something about Jesus every time I talk to them. It's to say that when I host family reunion, we're going to all hold hands and pray in this circle, and we'll pray in Jesus' name. Because that's what this looks like. I won't loan you $250 if you can't come to church with me no day. Oh, you need some money? Here's a seat next to me in the building. Come and hear the word of God. You want to talk? I'm going to end. I'm going to listen to you. But I'm going to end our conversation telling you about the one who has the answer to the thing that's troubling you deeply. This thing that won't go away. Come on. You got the light. And everybody else is in the dark. He says, go. They were to make disciples, one, by proclaiming the truth concerning Jesus. Next, their hearers were to be evangelized and enlisted followers of Christ. And we, the way that we could tell is that they've signed up, that they're serious about this, is that they are baptized. Would you pull up that text for me, friend? Hmm? Baptizing them in the name of the Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Now you see that those are titles. Father is a title, right? Yeah. Yeah. Son is a title, right? Holy Spirit's a title. Yeah. And there's only one name. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you understand? Uh -huh. You might be someone's sister, but your name isn't sister. Right. Amen. If you, you know, if you're from a black family, they may call you sister. Uh -huh. Amen. They call you, may call you, your nickname might be sis, uh -huh. right? But it's not your name. Isn't that right? Uh -huh. You might be someone's daughter, but your name is not daughter. Isn't that right? You may be someone's niece, and your name is not niece. In the name, there is one name. <laughs> Amen. That is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we baptize them. The, the, the point of baptism here, it's not a ritual. It's not a formality. Uh, uh, baptism is an identification. When I join the family of my husband, who I refer to as my boyfriend. I don't want anybody to be unclear. He's both my boyfriend and my husband. I wore a symbol of identification. Reminds me and everybody else. I'm in a covenant. Do you understand? When we get baptized, it's an outward symbol of an inward transformation. I went down. I'm identifying with him uh, in, in his death and in his resurrection. When I go down in the water, I, I'm identifying with his death. I'm saying, I'm dead to sin. The old, old, um, uh, old smooth you used to know from the street, uh, the old slick who you used to hang out with. Honestly, slick is dead, smooth is gone. I, I, I buried with Christ. I rise up from the water to walk in newness of life. I went down in Jesus' name and I rose up in newness of life. I, I changed my team. My identity is different. This is the same wig I used to wear. This is the same shoes I came in with, but I'm different on the inside. I'm different on the inside. Baptism, he said, first you got to make disciples. Once, once you've done your evangelizing, then they're baptized. Do you understand? Because baptism comes along with faith. When I believe, then I'm baptized. Huh? Huh? And then the other part of my evangelizing is that I teach them, let's see verse 20 there, that, that I engage in the work 
of teaching. How many people know obedience needs to be taught? How many people would say, certainly for yourself, when you grew up, you had to learn to be obedient? The Bible said Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. Now, some of us learned obedience, amen, through the white belt, through the switch, through the hairbrush, through the timeout. Come on, timeout is a little more modern, a little newer. How many people understand what I'm saying? Well, you learned obedience by your grandmother's swift hand. Come on, she had a stick, she had a switch. Some of y'all said, oh, no, they never beat me. Listen, tell the truth. Right? When my leg was burnt up, I decided to be obedient. When I could not sit down on my sore behind, right, Sister Angie? I learned obedience. We just don't come out obedient. We learn obedience. Now, we have to t obedience has to be taught. Amen. So we don't beat new converts, but we have to teach them. And we have to teach them with patience. We have to teach them with indoors. We have to teach them with gentleness because they don't know. And that's why we gr grieve God's heart. When we roll our eyes at somebody who hasn't yet learned well, well. that that's not a dress for church. Well, 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 well. Let's not roll our eyes. Uh -huh. Let's teach her. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, when a young man's uh, uh, underwear is bowed down under his bum bum, let's not roll our eyes. Let's just teach him. Yeah. Son, in church, oh. we, we don't show our underwear. Uh -huh. that's right. that's right. mm? We dress like a big boy in church. Right? We dress like a big boy. Mm -hmm. Showing your underwear is for little boys. But big boys, we dress like a big boy in church. And here's what, because it's decent. Because it honors the spirit of Christ. We have to teach them. He says, teach them to obey everything I commanded you. And so the twofold evangelistic thrust, first we go and then we, we evangelize until people come to the place of, of a faith in Christ. They're baptized. And then we teach them. Friends, the teaching is as important as as the witnessing. Uh, yes. Because if you don't teach me, I'll stay a baby. Yes. Oh, God. For God so loved the world yes. that he gave his only begotten son. Now you know one scripture. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Paul said, now we have to leave the principle, fundamental doctrine basics, and we need to go on to perfection. And he was disappointed. He said, now you're still drinking milk, but you should be eating meat. Somebody's got to be teaching you so you grow and mature. We don't grow unless we're taught. That's why Bible study means so much. That's why Sunday school means so much. That's why Sunday morning sermon means so much. That's why you shouldn't fall asleep as soon as the preaching starts because you can't grow unless somebody teaches you, corrects you. We don't like to be corrected. But do you know correction? Jesus said every person, every son, every daughter I receive gets a beating. If you don't get a beating, then you, you are a bastard and not a child. I didn't call you that. That's what the scripture said. And so these words are given to us as gerunds. Get going, start baptizing, keep teaching. Mm. Ephesians 4.11 says that God has given us this five-fold ministry uh -huh. to teach us, to build us, till we can come to the full stature, the full measure of the stature of Christ. Friends, we must see ourselves as perpetual learners in a family of teachers who are also learners. Matthew's last words to us, uh, our lasting words, Jesus is truly our Emmanuel. He's God with us. Huh? Jesus says, I'll be with you always, even until the end. Years ago, there was shampoo by a company called Fabergé. Who can remember that? So they said, Fabergé shampoo is so fabulous. When you use it, you're going to fall in love with it. You're not going to use Pantene. You're not going to use Cream of Nature. You're not going to use Suave because it's cheap in the grocery store. Come on. You're going to just use Fabergé. And when you use it, your hair is going to smell uh, so good that um, people are going to ask you, and you're going to tell two friends. And then they're going to tell two friends. Who can remember that? And so on, and so on, and so on. This gospel should be so good to you. This life in Christ should be so good to you that you're willing to tell two friends that your colleagues should know the gospel. Your nieces should hear the good news. Your next door neighbor should know more than you go out all dressed up on Sunday morning. They should hear the good news of the love of Jesus. Keon, I remember one time when you started coming to church early. One time you brought about six or seven friends. It filled my heart. You said, come on and hear God's word. Coming to water 
they're safe. You remember that, Keys? A whole bunch of friends came. This is what God calls us to do. We don't get to control fully the outcome, but we have a responsibility to tell them. When I was in elementary school, I went to a Christian after school program, and we sang the song. It said, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to share with everyone. You want to pass it on. The disciples were commissioned, and so were you. Whether or not you're following it at all. You can say live and let live, but that's not the word of God. You can say I'm okay and you're okay. That's not the word of God. Tell them the gospel. Jesus Christ came. He lived and walked among us. He performed miracles. And he was innocent of transgression, but he died on the cross of Calvary. As his hands were nailed and his feet nailed as a crown of thorns was in his head, as his heart exploded in his chest, the iniquities and the sins, the sorrow and the difficulty, the chastisement of peace was on him. He bore our sins. He carried our sorrows. Every iniquity was imposed on his body. He paid the cost so we wouldn't be lost. Tell somebody you've been commissioned. Let's pray. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is a light unto our path. We repent in these moments, all of us, for so many missed opportunities for people we've held the truth back from because we didn't want to offend them, for people we've held the truth back from because we didn't want to look like fanatics, for people we just didn't love enough to tell the truth to. And we pray now that you'll give us your heart. Yes, that you give us your heart. That you help us to be wise. You said that the one who wins a soul is wise. Help us to be wise and soul winning. Help us to sit down to breakfast and to lunch and to dinner. To make friends with people and to find a way for them to feel comfortable enough with us for us to share the gospel with them. Help us not to talk to our sons and not witness. Help us not to interact with our daughters and not witness. Help us not to host our grandchildren and not witness to them. Oh, God, we pray that we would be those who sow seeds of truth everywhere we go and that men and women and boys and girls will come to know you and come to have life everlasting. We pray that you'll help us to take seriously the, com <clears throat> the commission that we've been given to share the gospel. And we ask you, Lord, that you'd help us to have the incentive to go and then the incentive uh, to evangelize and the incentive to lead folks toward conversion and baptism. And that you'd skill us to teach them. Oh God, you'd give us skills to, to teach effectively and powerfully that men and women and boys and girls in our community, on our block, on our floor, who work in our department, who are related to us by blood, who are related to us in love, that they might come to know you. Help us to take this commission seriously, not just to clap about other people's, but to take ours seriously. In the strong and saving name of Jesus, who is Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.